that's kind of the hope with these funds that as soon as a family is aware of their loved one being missing, regardless of filing a missing person support, they're able to kind of get that immediate frontline support. Welcome to MCV Cast. That was Ivan McDonald, an advisor to the newly created Snowbird Fund. We'll hear more about this unprecedented effort to help Indigenous families searching for missing loved ones in a few moments. I'm Aaron Murphy. I'm here with the Executive Director of Montana Conservation Voters, Whitney Tani, Political Director, Jake Brown, and Program Director, Whitner Chase. On this vote, the ayes are 11 and the nays are 9. The nomination is favorably reported. With that bipartisan vote, the U.S. Senate's Energy and Natural Resources Committee on Thursday green-lighted the historic nomination of Representative Deb Holland to serve as Secretary of the Interior. Her nomination now goes to the full Senate, and we expect her to get at least the 51 votes she needs. Holland's committee vote mostly stayed within party lines. As expected, Montana Senator Steve Daines voted against her. He falsely claims Holland has, quote, radical views, even though Daines strongly supported the unlawful, extremely partisan, anti-public lands radical William Perry Pendley at the Bureau of Land Management. But unlike Danes, Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska voted with courage on Thursday. She supported Holland, saying she will back the first Native American to hold the position of Interior Secretary. I also fully anticipate that she will have a strong management team in place with people who understand the value of resource development from public lands. She needs this. We need this within the Department of Interior. So I am going to place my trust in Representative Holland and her team, despite some very real misgivings. And I I, I guess I would direct this to Representative Holland, if you're listening, know that I intend to work with you because I want you to be successful. And quite honestly, we need you to be successful. But I am also going to hold you to your commitments to ensure that Alaska is allowed to prosper. The Montana legislature will return to Helena next week for the second half of this year's session. This week, the legislature scrambled to pass as many bills as possible before Wednesday's transmittal deadline. That's the cutoff point for lawmakers to introduce most new bills. On Monday alone, legislators heard nearly 150 bills, and MCV is tracking it all. Jake and Whitner, what are the highlights of the week? Whitney, let's start with some hopeful news. In addition to the fact that the legislature struck down the so-called right-to-work bill this week with bipartisan opposition, that's a big deal and a good reminder that Montana values outweigh partisan ideals. Last week, we talked about legislation to delay the implementation of recreational marijuana sales in Montana. That's a problem for conservationists and a majority of Montana voters who approved Initiative 190 last November tax revenue from recreational marijuana is designed to fund state-owned public lands. Well, the House Business and Labor Committee tabled that bill, which means it's hopefully dead. Speaking of funding for public lands, lawmakers are considering a bill from Representative Jeff Wellborn of Dillon, a Republican. His Senate Bill 153 would transfer management of Montana's fishing access sites and wildlife management areas to the Montana Parks and Recreation Board. Currently, the Montana Fish and Wildlife Commission oversees fishing access in wildlife areas. Wildlife organizations say they could be open to the idea if changes are made. Representative Wellborn says he's willing to negotiate and that he wrote the bill in response to overcrowding on the Madison River. Montana's popular renewable energy standard is also under fire from Republican Representative Jerry Schillinger of Circle. The Renewable Energy Standard requires developers in Montana to ensure that 15% of their output is renewable energy. Schillinger's House Bill 576 would repeal the standard altogether. Another bill, House Bill 475, from Republican Representative Derek Skees of Kalispell, would count hydroelectric power from existing dams and nuclear power as renewable energy. Opponents including MCV, say this bill defeats the purpose of the Renewable Energy Standard, which is designed to incentivize the development of new renewable energy resources. Here's Democratic Representative Denise Heyman of Bozeman. Mr. Chair, nuclear power is not guaranteed to be green. Um, I am a huge problem with this. I have a huge problem with the bill. 
And on top of it, you think you're going to slip in nuclear when there is no information about nuclear. You're going to do it in the 12th hour. And um, it's, it's not okay. The Montana Senate passed two anti-wolf bills this week. Both of them come from Republican Senator Bob Brown of Thompson Falls. Senate Bill 267 allows wolf hunters and trappers to be reimbursed for the cost of hunting and trapping wolves. That would be your tax money, and it's something we consider a crazy fringe benefit for killing wolves. Brown Senate Bill 314 would allow extreme wolf hunting measures, including baiting, night hunting, and no bag limits, in an attempt to drive wolf numbers down. Both bills now go before the Montana House. In the House, meantime, passed what we believe is another extreme bill going after the First Amendment rights of citizens to peacefully protest. Representative Steve Gunderson, a Republican from Libby, is behind House Bill 481. It imposes enhanced penalties of up to 30 years in prison and $150,000 fines for people found guilty of damaging critical infrastructure like oil pipelines and power stations. It also heavily penalizes organizations that are found to be a conspirator with protesters, even if those organizations don't participate in a protest. Gunderson specifically cited the protests of the Dakota Access Pipeline in North Dakota several years ago, but Representative Tom France in Missoula says the bill is overreaching and unnecessary. Uh, not only, I, I think, will lead to real constitutional issues uh, on places where protest occurs, but especially as to uh, parties that might not even be in the in the area, but who have advocated for a certain course of action being held liable. I just, I think this was the wrong way to resolve these issues. And I'd close just by saying that I think we have uh, a, an existing legal structure and criminal penalties to deal with situations where the right of assembly and the right of speech crosses over into vandalism or uh, other types of crimes. House Bill 613 also got a hearing this past week. This pro-voting rights legislation comes from Democratic Representative Sharon Stewart Paragoy of Crow Agency. She introduced her bill by summarizing a long and painful history of voter suppression in Indigenous communities. Many of them consider voting a valued tradition since Indigenous American citizens weren't even allowed to vote a century ago. This is the um, Montana American Indian Voting Rights Act um, to ensure that um, this generational tradition that we have now come into <laughs> uh, continues without, uh, without challenges or obstacles. And so I would um, ask for a due pass. House Bill 613 establishes permanent satellite election offices on all seven reservations and ballot drop boxes for mail ballots. It also addresses guidelines to track home addresses of voters since many Indigenous voters rely on post office boxes and live in shared housing. Andy Work Jr. is the president of the Fort Belknap community. He was among more than a dozen supporters who told lawmakers that better access to voting is good for democracy. You know, these satellite voting offices work. And, you know, obviously, like you've heard, this is about equity. Um, over half of Blaine County, where the majority of Fort Belknap is in, um, is Native American. And like you've heard, uh, our tribal members have to drive long distances to the courthouses. And our turnout uh, since we've had those alternative voting sites um, has doubled uh, since then. Representative Sharon Stewart Paragoy is also sponsoring several bills tackling the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous people. The Senate Judiciary Committee will hear two of those bills next Wednesday, March 10th, one to establish a Missing Persons Response Team Training Grant Program and another to establish a Missing Persons Review Commission. This week's guests are part of an innovative new effort in Montana to provide critical support as families search for missing loved ones. This week, we're honored to have several Montanans join us to talk about the Snowbird Fund, a new effort to directly support community searches for missing Indigenous people in Montana. Whitney Williams, a businesswoman and former candidate for governor, launched the program in February through the Montana Community Foundation. Whitney joins us along with committee member Ivan McDonald. Ivan is a filmmaker and activist. We're also joined by Mary Rutherford, the president and CEO of Montana Community Foundation. Thank you all for joining us on MCBcast. 
Uh, Whitney Williams, let's start with you. Take us through what led to your decision to launch the Snowbird Fund and, and what exactly does it do? Yeah, well, thanks so much, Aaron and Whitney, for having us. We're delighted to be here and hi to Ivan and, and Mary. Um, so let me say that the real origin for this uh, idea came from communities across the state, uh, starting with um, Ivan McDonald, who's here with us today, and then also some aunties who contacted me when I was running for governor to say, hey, what are you going to do about murdered and missing Indigenous people in this state? And these aunties had lost their nieces to this tragic violence, and they wanted to know, uh, you know, at the time um, I was running for a policy position, what was I going to do? And so I called them. I got to know more about the issue. Um, I certainly was aware of the issue, but I didn't have any idea what was actually happening across the state, which is that family members are searching, as anyone would expect, uh, for their loved ones immediately following loved ones going missing, in large part because they're not getting help from the communities that ought to be helping them. Uh, and what that means is that there are already uh, often cases, you know, oftentimes people are strapped for cash. Um, we've got real high poverty rates in this state, certainly in Indian country and in other pockets of Montana. And these family members are going out and footing the bill for doing these searches and filling up tanks of gas for themselves or their nephews or other friends. They're, you know, buying, you know, lunches or coffee or or, or food for people as they're going through these searches, they're needing to have technology like drones, uh, metal detectors, um, and some of them are, you know, going broke, uh, searching for family members. And so what we discovered is we were sort of talking with a number of family members over the course of the summer and this fall, is that it's, it's happening all across the state, that family members are looking for their loved ones. And one of the things that we felt like we might be able to do is just offer a little bit of support. Um, by getting them some cash in their pockets to just have a little bit of money to be able to do what they're already doing. And so we approached the Montana Community Foundation and asked them if they would be our partner. And we got very lucky in that they decided to sort of take this risk. And I say risk because this is the first of its kind in Montana. And we thank the nation um, that actually offers direct financial support to family members looking for their loved ones. Ivan McDonald, you're an advocate for raising awareness of missing and murdered Indigenous people, and you're a documentary filmmaker. What brought you to this initiative? Yeah, you know, my work that I do with my sister, that's kind of been the genesis of our feature-length documentary, When They Were Here, um, started probably about four or five years ago, but really is um, kind of existed probably for like the last 40 years or so. Um, our cousin Monica while still smoking, was kidnapped and murdered on the Blackfeet Reservation in 1979 at the age of seven. And um, we've kind of always lived with the specter of, of that history within our family. And Monica was always sort of a, a story we heard growing up and almost a, a cautionary tale for us as children. And um, when the work began, when my sister and I first started documenting these stories, it was kind of to try to understand our own family's history with the crisis, but um, also kind of examined the larger view of what the Michigan Murdered Indigenous Woman in Crisis is for um, the communities that we come from. And um, yeah, just started documenting, did a few small shorts. Um, it's kind of grown into bigger projects, such as the ESPN short, Black Feet Boxing, Not Invisible, we did. Um, a current television show we're developing. And um, we think of that idea of the sto storytelling as justice, and so many families have stories to tell. And we hope that there is some form of justice in letting them tell their stories. Mary Rutherford, you said the Montana Community Foundation has never done anything like this before. What makes the Snowbird Fund so unique? So we have 1,300 distinct funds that benefit a variety of purposes in Montana. And this is the only fund that we have that's established for emergent needs and directly supporting people who are in need. Most of the time, our grant making goes to nonprofit organizations who in turn help those people. So this is a fund that will 
make dollars immediately available to people who are in crisis. And so that's what makes this unique for us. And also, frankly, the turnaround time. You know, we are committed to prioritizing getting these dollars out the door as quickly as the grants committee, the committee that's working on this fund, the Snowbird Committee, actually makes those grant recommendations. So processing them very quickly, getting those dollars out the door directly to the people who are desperately searching for their loved ones. Ivan, one of your roles is to review applications for financial support when families are in need of um, funding. So what does that process look like and who's on the review committee? What do you look for? Yeah, so under the Montana Community Foundation, it's myself, um, Marilyn Bruger zimmerman and Anna Whiting-Sorrell and Jessica Kuntz, all at the Montana Community Foundation. And usually we probably have processed about two to three um, requests in kind of various capacities. The few, one of them I know we did have to let the individual know that we are funding just searches at the moment, um, kind of that first frontline on the ground search, search funding, which a lot of the families um, need when their loved one goes missing, because oftentimes they're the first one searching. But yeah, the process just comes in. They submit a small application. We usually meet that same day um, to kind of go over and discuss the funding opportunities, and then from there, grant the request. And Ivan, you've mentioned you've been part of searches for missing people before, and I'm curious about the the timing of, of financial resources, especially how important it is to have resources like what the Snowbird Fund will provide so early in the process. Can you speak to to, to why that's so critical? Yeah, I would say probably say 90 percent of the stories we've covered and the majority of the searches that we've been a part of with for different family members, such as um, Ashley Loring Heavy Runner, who's missing on the Blackfeet Reservation, went missing in 2017, is also a relative of ours. And we've been on a few searches with her families, organized by her family and conducted by her family. Um, Been on a few searches for Jermaine Charlo. And um, a lot of the times the families... um, sort of begin the searches themselves. There has been some issues around family members being able to submit um, missing persons claims and getting missing persons reports filed. Um, We know that there's been some issues related around that. And, you know, I think that when families immediately understand when something is wrong or know something's wrong, I'd probably even say like the first 12 hours, first six, 12 hours, as quickly as possible, you can start conducting a search of a missing person is so important. And that's kind of the hope with these funds, that as soon as a family is aware of their loved one being missing, regardless of filing a missing person's report, they're able to kind of get that immediate frontline support of whether it's, you know, gas. Oftentimes you're covering an expense. So take, for example, the Blackfeet Reservation is 1.5 million acres the size of Delaware. And if you're covering different areas of it where your loved one might have been last seen, you're covering a lot of ground. So, um, yeah, I think that that immediate support is incredibly important and such a jump start. So hopefully recovering a loved one. So, Mary, this financial support comes in the form of donations to families in need. Um, Is there any small print? So there is no fine print. And I think that's another thing that makes this kind of unique for us. You know, we we call this trust-based philanthropy. And we know that the local community members who are searching for their loved ones know what they need. And we're going to trust that that they're going to use these funds in a way that's meaningful to them. And so I think, frankly, that's one of the reasons that um, people continue to respond to this call for funding, you know. Um, folks have been very generous. They understand the, the need is now, the need is immediately and immediate, and they want to get these dollars out the door, as do we. And so there's no fine print. You know, once the committee makes a grant recommendation, we're getting those dollars out the door, and we're wishing these families the very best as they search for their loved ones. And Whitney, it's up and running. I just was actually on the site donating. So hopefully um, you'll see that soon. And of course, there's a need for further financial support. So what can folks do if they're interested in contributing? Oh, well, Whit, thank you for the donation. And yeah, you know what? Um, As Anna Whiting Sorrell said, um, a little bit is as good as a lot. Um, And I thought that was so well said. It really does go a long way. You know, 100% of everything that people give is going directly back out 
to families any of the um, minimal costs that we uh, need to pay um, are being paid separately. So 100% of folks' dollars go straight to families. And so they can just visit snowbirdfund.org um, and learn more. Um, there's some really good resources there on the Montana Community Foundation website that tell a little bit more about some of the issue, um, which we'll keep updating over time, but certainly welcome folks to join us. You know, we, um, at least over here in Missoula, we're starting to warm up a little bit after two weeks of like deep freeze. And, you know, we have been talking about this idea, right, of neighborliness in Montana and sort of taking care of one another. And when you drive down the street and you see that car in a ditch, you never see just one car in a ditch. You always see two because someone stopped because people help their neighbors in this state. And we do think that this Snowbird Fund is sort of uh, a reflection of what we believe to be the best in us. And we certainly invite uh, Montanans and others who care about our beautiful state and all of our neighbors uh, to join us. And visiting snowbirdfund.org is a great way to do that. Is there anything that uh, any of you would like to add or wish we'd asked you? Well, I would just like to say that, you know, I think that the work Whitney Snowbird Fund, um, the work Whitney's been doing, I think that a good thing to note is that, you know, this came from the communities that are experiencing the crisis. As someone who's been doing this work for a while, you know, you'll have state agencies, federal agencies being, oh my God, yeah, oh, we do have a problem, you know, after so much pushback from communities, and, you know, they kind of realize they have a problem and then they kind of start doing all of this policy work, um, legislation, different sort of fixes without really turning to the communities and asking, well, what do you need? You guys are the front lines of this. What resources do you need? And I think Whitney was very cognizant of that when um, Snowbird was being conceptualized. And my sister and I were a part of the initial interviews of what families really needed. And, um, you know, I think that's so important that um, the communities that were experiencing this crisis were listened to first, as opposed to, you know, there's always that saying, nothing nothing for us without us. And so I think that that's such an important important aspect of the Snowbird Fund. And, you know, my sister and I get asked to be a part of different MMIW-related um, things. And I think really this one was something that we decided, or at least I decided to partner with, just due to the, the great importance. Well, thank you for that. That's Ivan McDonald, Whitney Williams, and Mary Rutherford. You can find the Snowbird Fund at snowbirdfund.org or through the Montana Community Foundation's website, and that is mtcf.org. Ivan, Whitney, Mary, thanks for joining us on MCVCast. Thanks, guys. The views of our guests do not necessarily reflect the views of MCV, its staff, or its board of directors. And as a matter of full disclosure, Whitney Williams previously served on the board of directors of MCV. The U.S. House passed a major conservation bill this past week. The Protecting America's Wilderness and Public Lands Act was actually a combination of eight previously introduced conservation bills. The legislation affects land and water in Washington State, Arizona, Colorado, and California, including wilderness designations for 1.5 million acres of public land. Montana's only member of the U.S. House, Matt Rosendale, voted against the bill. It's unclear if or when the Senate will take it up. Three of Montana's mayors have joined dozens of others across the country in supporting 30 by 30. That's the national push to conserve at least 30% of America's land and ocean by the year 2030. Our parks and open space, rivers and ocean, rural and coastal communities are at risk from pollution, unchecked development, and drilling. MCV is proudly on board. Mayors Wilmot Collins of Helena, John Angan of Missoula, and Cindy Andrus of Bozeman all signed a letter in support of 30 by 30, along with 67 other mayors. Also among them, Mayor Lauren McLean of Boise, Idaho. To get there, it will take everyone. Our work will center efforts led locally by people who know best the places we must protect. From urban and rural communities, to tribal nations, private landowners, and people that are working every day to protect the places we call home. Others who signed on include the mayors of Chicago, Phoenix, and Miami. Most of them are nonpartisan office holders, but some are Democrats and some are Republicans. Senator Steve Daines, by the way, opposes the 30 by 30 initiative. 
falsely stating that it will lock up public lands. Mayor Wilmot Collins of Helena says it's sad to see Senator Danes politicizing conservation. Our neighbors to the south have an ambitious new climate goal from their governor. Many states talk about the importance of net zero carbon emissions, but today I challenge you to join me in making Wyoming net negative in CO2 emissions. Fossil energy makes that possible. We have to take the lead and not look back. That's the best and maybe only way to meet the threats we face. That was Republican Governor Mark Gordon of Wyoming giving his State of the State address on Tuesday. Wyoming is the nation's top coal producing state. And while Governor Gordon wants the cowboy state to go carbon negative, he also stayed very firm on his commitment to sustaining coal, oil and gas production in Wyoming and had tough words for President Joe Biden's climate policies. All decisions from DC must now pass a superficial climate litmus test that ignores jobs, costs, reliability, and in many cases, real climate solutions. In DC, they claim to follow science, but they adopt policies that resemble science fiction. Gordon didn't offer specifics about how exactly to go carbon negative, but he did focus on carbon sequestration technology, and he called for more research and more use of hydrogen to power vehicles. Mother's Day is still a few weeks away, but maybe it's worth planning early this year. That's because the state of Montana will allow free fishing this Mother's Day weekend, May 8th and 9th. We have Democratic State Senator Pat Flowers to thank. Governor Greg Gianforte recently signed Senator Flowers' bill allowing for free Mother's Day fishing for all the moms out there. We regret to share news of the passing of one of Montana's most effective conservation champions. Klaus von Studerheim died this past Monday, March 1st. He revitalized the Sealy Lake Community Council, protected more than 30,000 acres of Plum Creek forest land, and was instrumental in bringing land managers together. Whereas Klaus is a devoted fundraiser for the community who never fails to generate dollars for worthy causes, going so far as to proudly auction off pieces of the Berlin Wall. Just a few weeks ago, Missoula County Commissioners honored Von Studerheim for his many years of advocacy. And we'll leave you today with a bit of their proclamation about his life and legacy. We'll be back next week. Now, therefore, the Missoula Board of County Commissioners hereby declares February 16th, 2021 as Klaus von Stutterheim Day in Missoula County. We urge all Missoula County residents to emulate the example of Klaus and give back to their friends, neighbors, and community in a way that leaves this place better than we found it. Signed, the Board of County Commissioners in Missoula County, Montana, Dave Strohmeyer, Josh Lotnick, and Juanita Vero.